G'day and welcome to the Off Chain Podcast. Don here with you and today's guest, Dr. Ben Gertzel. He's been called the prophet of AI and AI is Rosetta Stone. He's a founder of Singularity Net, which uses blockchain to make AI available on the open market. He founded Singularity Net so that he can make a more democratic future for AI. Ben's also the chairman of the Open Cog Foundation and the Artificial General Intelligence Society, and he works as chief scientist for many others. He is a true polymath. His research encompasses multiple areas, including artificial general intelligence, um, natural language processing, cognitive science, machine learning, computational finance, bioinformatics, virtual worlds, gaming, uh, parapsychology, and theoretical physics. So you know it's going to be an interesting and wide-ranging conversation today. He's published 25-plus scientific books, about 150 technical papers. We're really excited to have him on the show. So let's dive into our conversation with Dr. Ben Gertzel. Ben, AI is blowing up. Um, all over the place. People are talking about it. Uh, every podcast, including this podcast, we're talking about it. Um, and one of the people who has been thinking about AI, uh, preparing for AI, and even making AI happen is yourself. Uh, can you tell us, how did you get started in artificial intelligence? When did you get started in artificial intelligence? So I started being interested in AI when I was probably three years old or something and saw a robots on on tv and shows like the the original star trek and it seemed apparent to me even as a young child that you know the human mind is not going to be the smartest system uh in in the physical universe right and and just like we built cars that could drive faster than us and planes that can fly higher than we can jump we're going to build machines that can think better than than we can think and and then uh in my teenage years, I discovered there was an actual research field of AI. It wasn't just science fiction, got more and more interested in it. I ended up doing a PhD in math rather than AI because in the 1980s, the time period when I was going to grad school, the AI field was just going in a very boring direction. They were working on so-called expert systems where people tried to code in explicitly like a list of all the knowledge that AI would have rather than having the AI learn it from experience. And it seemed like that was just obviously wrong. So I did a PhD in math in the late eighties, but I was interested in building real thinking machines, you know, all, all through both because it's an amazing intellectual challenge. Cause I was curious how my own mind and other minds worked and building a simulation of something seems like the the best way to test whether you understand it. And also because it seemed apparent that whatever other problems you wanted to solve, if you could build a really smart AI system and it was cooperative with you, right, then that will solve all your other problems uh, all at once. I mean, in the same sense that we can solve all at once a huge number of problems that like mice or dogs or, or, or monkeys have, right? So really my interest in AI came from a general conceptual place of just science fictional or, or philosophical thinking. Then I got deep into the technical aspects and realized how hard the problem is <laughs> in a, at a detail level, even though at a certain conceptual level, it's, it's simple, right? I mean, Minds are systems for recognizing patterns in themselves and their environments. They recognize patterns in what actions they take will tend to achieve what goals. So at a philosophy level, is simple. At an engineering and computer science level, it's hard. I've been working on it since the late 80s. There's been other folks working on it even longer. I mean, the term AI was introduced in the late 50s. The first neural net was designed in the 1940s, right? But... The last few years, obviously, the rubber has been hitting the road, and a lot of ideas have been around in the AI field for a very long time. You know, they're now starting to to bear a tremendous amount of practical fruit. In what kinds of ways was AI in your thinking as a young person, and then as you were growing up, um, different to your experience in the AI field, even at the moment, or even looking ahead? Well, one can think about a distinction between narrow AIs that focus on solving one particular sort of problem, like only playing chess or only playing board games or only driving cars, 
And then what I've called AGI, artificial general intelligence, which is AI that can leap beyond its programming, leap beyond its training data, leap into the unknown and just conjecture something cool with some degree of validity to it, right? But uh, not that much certainty. And what's interesting about the human mind is in large part the way it can make uncertain leaps into the unknown like that. And that that's what always interested me. And I was always a little bored with the tendency of the AI field to focus on highly task-specific AI solutions, although I, I worked on a number of those myself to earn a living in domains like finance and, and robotics and medicine and so national security. I mean, it's, it's good stuff, building task-specific AIs that solve real problems, but yet making an AI that can take a leap into the unknown is far more interesting. It also brings with it the potential for that AI to figure out how to improve itself. Because to radically improve yourself, almost by definition, you're taking a leap into the unknown. You're modifying yourself to become something your previous self couldn't understand, right? And what's how, happened how can, in the AI How come we're not there already? What's the, defi- <laughs> what's the deficit? Because it seems to me, is it like a, is it a computing problem? I uh, wouldn't have enough processing I think, I power. Think, what's the story? I mean, first of all, the whole, f- while the field of AI has been around like 75 years or so, 80 years, depending on how you measure it. In a way, that can seem like a long time because we get new versions of a, of a phone every six months. But, I mean, in, in the scale of human history, it's very recent, right? Like the first computers that were the size of, an, of, an, uh, of a house, I mean, that was only 70 years ago. Humanity's been, been around quite some time. Civilization's been around 10,000 years. So, I mean, the, in a way, the development of computers and AI is going insanely fast by the standards of, of, of human history. But as to why we haven't gotten to AGI yet, yeah, I think that the core of it has been computing power. And what we've seen with neural networks in the last eight, nine years, we've seen that a lot of old ideas about neural networks going back to the 1960s and 70s with moderate tweaks, but run on modern hardware can do amazing things, right? So, I mean, you had multi-layer neural nets in the late 60s and, and early 70s, but when I was teaching neural nets in the university in the mid 90s, I mean, to train a neural net with 30 neurons using recurrent back propagation took all day on one of the university servers, right? So I think that with the computer firepower, we had historically many of the more ambitious ideas we had about how to make thinking machines just weren't feasible. And the field then went in a direction of, you know, simpler things that could run better on the hardware that was available then. Having more compute power lets us explore more of the ideas that have been around a long time and vary on them and tweak them, see what works, see, see what doesn't, come up with it with it with a few new ideas here and there. And I think what's what's happened with neural nets in the last few years is gonna happen in the next few years with a whole bunch of other ideas from the history of, of AI that have been, you know, screwed around with but haven't really born fruit to their fullest potential because of lack of compute power. And I mean, the compute power is now there with, with the GPUs, with supercomputers, with the, with the internet and all the, all the decentralized networks of compute power we can, we can pull together with all the, with all the, all the data on the, on the internet. So, I mean, I think the biggest reason we're not to AGI yet, has been lack of compute power, but we should also understand in a historical sense, it hasn't been all that long. I mean, if you were gonna try to emulate the human brain in detail, I would say neuroscience is a bottleneck because we, we understand moderately well how the human brain does perception and and motor action and some kinds of short-term memory. We don't really understand how the human brain does abstract learning or compassion and empathy or some of the more re- refined aspects of, of human intelligence. But if, if you're not trying to do brain emulation and you're just like, 
let's get really, really smart systems by cobbling together some understanding of the human brain, some understanding of the human mind, some math, a bunch of computer science. I mean, I, I think for this sort of integrative approach to building AGI systems, compute power has been the biggest bottleneck. Now that we have so much compute power, you can run experiments so fast. It's a heck of a lot more more fun to be doing applied stuff in the AI space. So I actually hadn't thought about it the way you just described it before. So is the goal with AGI to create a human-like intelligence, but way, way, way more intelligent uh, well, with I more think computational power, or is it to be, come up with something? There's going to be many different AI systems, right? And I mean, flying machines are a well-worn but reasonable analogy. Like there's there's a lot of flying machines that can get people and stuff in the air, right? You got helicopters, you got airplanes, you've got you've got blimps, you, got, you have backpack helicopters, you have gliders, you have space shuttles, you have you have rockets, you have international space station. So, I mean, the principles of aerodynamics. Once you understand how to apply them, let you make a great number of different flying machines with different strengths and weaknesses. And I think thinking machines, it's sort of the same thing. You can make a lot of different artificial intelligences i mean just like there's a lot of different animals running around on the on the surface of the pla- of the planet right and emulating exactly how humans work it's an interesting thing to do we don't know enough about neurobiology to really approach that with full accuracy now so what we're doing in practice we're looking at building general intelligences that have a lot of the cognitive architecture of the human mind but don't try to emulate the human brain in detail. They sort of cobble together various computer science and math algorithms in a sort of rough emulation of the architecture of the human mind. And what that means partly is once you get something that is human level in most important respects of intelligence, it's going to be massively beyond human level in, in some respects. And of course, Computers are already massively beyond human level at mm. searching large troves of, of data and at, at doing arithmetic like a calculator, right? So it's hardly surprising that by the time we get an AGI that's equal to humans in every important respect, it's also going to be way, way beyond humans in, in, in some important respects. So not, not really a human emulation, but a different sort of, system that shares a lot of capabilities with humans. Now, what's interesting, you know, in the last year or two with transformer neural nets and then chat GPT is the transformer neural net that sort of uh, set the world on fire. What's interesting here is these systems, they stand in a strange position with regard to the narrow AI versus artificial general intelligence dichotomy, because in a way, they're narrow systems. They can't go very far beyond their training data. But a system like ChatGPT has so much training data that not being able to go that far beyond your training data is not that that big an impediment for most everyday sure. life purposes, right? Like, I mean, the, these systems will never invent a new branch of science. They'll never invent an interesting new genre of music, right? I mean, they're stuck sort of varying on and recombining the stuff in the training data sets. But the training data set is everything on the fucking internet, right? So, I mean, I mean, that covers an awful lot of what human beings care about, which is, is kind of fascinating, right? So, you, I mean, you're, you're faced with the realization that I don't know exactly what percent, maybe 80% of human jobs that people get paid for require no fundamental, you know, human compassion and feeling and also require no fundamental innovation and can probably be done perfectly well by systems that just munch together and adapt stuff that's been that's been done before right like you don't you don't you don't need to invent new branches of science or new genres of music that often in in most jobs people do to to earn a living so one one thing we're seeing now is a lot of the economic impact and social impact and even psychological impact that I thought was going to come from the launch of 
AGI, of machines that can really think like people, a lot of this impact is going to be absorbed by the world beforehand with these uh, transformer neural net systems that are sort of narrow, but based on the humongous training training data set, right? They're, I mean, they're, they're closed scope systems in a way. They're never going to fundamentally grow beyond their training data, but they can still massively disrupt our economy by, you know, doing significant majority of jobs people do. So this is, this is interesting and not precisely something I anticipated. It wasn't clear to me that these sort of narrow training data bound systems would get as far as they've been able to. Yeah, gotcha. Well, so if, if we're thinking about uh, AGI specifically, not just so much these more task-based kinds of things, uh, what is the purpose? Like, what's the point of AGI, especially if we're not looking at being necessarily bound by trying to recreate the human mind or the human brain? If we're looking at something that is uh, at least that, but perhaps significantly more than that, or just generally different, a completely different kind of structure of thinking and uh, and, and conceiving, uh, what's the point? What, what are we doing this for? Is it for humans? Is it because we can? Is it because that's... The future, uh, what, what's the, I mean, for you, you, I mean, personally, you for you, back, what's the goal? If you step back from our individual lives, I mean, what are we doing this for? It's not even the right way to put it. What's happening is just the ongoing, you know, ramification and development of complexity in the, in the universe, right? I mean, you started out with the uh, light and the uh, hot matter, and then it, it cooled down into... At atoms and, and molecules, and then we have suns and planets, and we have one-celled life, we have multi-celled life, you know, we, we have uh, intelligence like humans, we build tools, we, we, we build machines, then we build AIs, and I mean, this is, this is sort of increasing complexity of forms in the universe, and we're, we're part of this, right? So this is sort of how our universe appears to be so like, a, like a, an evolutionary inevitability is AGI. Yeah, I mean, inevitability would be strong because, I mean, the sun could blow up early and we're sure, all fried. Sure. But, but, I mean, but I I think, yeah, I think any civilization that gets to the point of developing language and tools is very likely going to get to the point of developing AI. And then once you've developed AI, you'll get AI that can develop even smarter AI. So I, I mean, it's sort of a sort of inevitable once once you get as far as an industrial revolution that you're gonna you're gonna get to to this this point, right? But uh, in terms of what value is AGI to us in our human lives, I mean, you could list a few things like uh, you know curing death, curing disease, curing mental illness, like creating, curing scarcity by creating sort of molecular nano assemblers that can 3D print any ordinary physical object that, that you want, you know, solving cheap energy by making nuclear fusion work. I mean, really, if you had an AI system 10 times as smart as people or 100 times as smart as people that wanted to help people with at least a fraction of its energy and intelligence. I mean, the problems that stump us now, most of them are going to seem really easy to this sort of, of system. I mean, in, 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 in the same way that the problems that stump, you know, my pet dogs, some of them are quite easy for me. Like they can't find food. Well, hey, I can I can go to the store. I can go slaughter a large animal, right? I can do a lot of things just beyond their capability that solve some of their problems in the in a way that's incomprehensible but but amazing to them, right? So I mean I think that the upsides for humanity are tremendous and really the question isn't to me the good question isn't what's the point? The question is how to maximize the odds that this near inevitable development will come out beneficially for us rather mm -hmm. than creating AGIs that are sort of indifferent to their creators or something, which is not impossible. I mean, our, our attitude toward the 
great apes and similar systems that preceded us is a bit ambivalent as a species, right? I mean, we've destroyed their destroyed their habitat and and killed a bunch of our evolutionary predecessors. Although we also now in recent decades are getting more compassionate about it and trying to trying to prevent extinction and preserve habitats and so on. So like how do we how do we bias the outcome of technological singularity in which AGI exceeds human intelligence? How do we bias the outcome of that in a in a positive direction? And that's uh, that's a question, you know, that's of practical value because I mean we may may well be able to influence the the nature of the post-human era that we create. Okay, well, I do actually really want to get on to that and, and the <laughs> ethics of AI in particular, uh, but perhaps just one more kind of foundational question then. Um, if, say, the intelligence between your dog and yourself is vast uh, and the intelligence uh, between yourself and a future AGI is, say, just as vast, what is the upper limit on that intelligence? Is it just then computing power or is it just time, uh, time for the kind of self-development and replication kind of process to go on? Or what's what's the barrier? What's the kind say, of upper echelon? We can't, we can't really know that. I mean, if we, if we pay attention to current theories of physics, there's something called the, the Bekenstein bound, which bounds the amount of information you can fit in a given amount of mass energy, which is calculated in sort of in terms of the uh, amount of information on the surface of a black hole containing a certain amount of mass. So, I mean, you, you, could, you could try to bound the intelligence of a physical system in terms of like, how smart could a physical system be if it made optimal use of all the mass energy in the universe? But in the end, humanity has overturned its own physics theories every 50 years or so for a while. So the, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, the odds that super AGI will still think about physics the same way as we do seem low to me. So like what other dimensions will it, will it discover, right? I, I have no idea. To me, to me, our goal is to create the next step beyond us and increase the odds that this next step beyond us has a compassionate and respectful and helpful attitude toward us. And then that's, that's far enough out to try to think in a rigorous and solid way. Although of course it's, it's fascinating to uh, in, intuit and, and daydream and, and speculate and feel about, about the broader future beyond that. Mm. Well, okay, so then when you say us, who do you mean? Do you mean the developers? Do you mean humankind generally? Do you mean a particular group of people who get to decide the future of AI? Who are we talking about here? Well, so I would like, I would like it to be so that humanity as a whole is deciding the future of humanity as, as a whole so that we bring as as much as possible of humanity's collective brain power into charting the path forward towards superhuman AGI. And that just seems to make good common sense because there's, there's more intelligence in the totality of humanity than in any, any, any small group. There's, there's more depth of, of understanding. And this, this gets into why I founded SingularityNet, the, the blockchain project of which I'm now, now CEO, right? Because if you look at the mainstream trajectory that the AI field seems to be following, it's going to end up with smarter and smarter AIs, you know, owned and controlled by a few big tech companies, which have close ties to the military and intelligence organizations of particular countries, right? And that's, I don't think these are mostly bad people involved with these companies and the military and intelligence agencies for, for that matter. Most of these are well-meaning people trying to do what's best according to their belief systems. But I don't think any small elite group of people should be controlling this uh, super AGI as it, as it emerges, I'd like to see it, you know, come out of a more 
decentralized and and democratic decision base and doing that leads to a host of different practical as well as as technical problems i think a significant part of what you need there is the right decentralized and democratically controlled tech stack sort of compute infrastructure for for running the ai but that's not the only thing right i mean you need the right culture among among the, the people who are, are thinking about that ai as it as it develops as well and you're not going to get complete egalitarian i mean if my own ai team develops the first agi no doubt we have more influence over it than a, than a than a random person but we, we we do want to have the ai deployed on a decentralized network that's run on you know millions of machines in every country of the world owned by all sorts of different people and we want the people who are hosting the nodes of this to have some agency over you know the direction of the algorithms and the, and the thinking of the, the ai that that they're they're co-hosting and this this is how i got into blockchain right i mean i've been into ai since forever around 2001 or so when the internet was getting bigger and bigger i started to think how do you put strong encryption and distributed computing and democratic governance together but it was very hard with java 1.1 and the computing at that time so then when you know computing power got faster you got ethereum you got smart contracts and you got cardano then then you get our own layer one chain hypercycle that we've just launched right so with faster and faster computers you're able to actually put strong encryption distributed computing democratic governance together in a way that gives you a decentralized infrastructure for deploying ai systems which is it's interesting for narrow ai applications in some vertical markets but it may be really instrumental by the time we get to agi because what it means is when you get to AGI, that AGI is controlled by a vast decentralized network of, of humans around 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 the globe, rather than by some particular elite group. So I'm absolutely down with the uh, decentralized, distributed kind of version of uh, events as you've just talked about. My question, though, is if, like you said before, um, scientific discovery kind of upends the status quo every 50 years or so, if you're talking about uh, even morality and ethics, ethics, ethics maybe less so, but morality uh, changes maybe generationally. Are we now kind of drawing a line in the sand and saying we have arrived now, we're the ones who get to decide, uh, we're putting in this uh, 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 like evolutionary big step into AGI, we're deciding we now ethically get to decide because we, if you look even just politically around the world at the moment, we can't decide on anything, we can't agree on anything. Uh, between you know tribalism and uh, you know different even different beliefs on the um, the the worth of a human life or humanity generally th- you know things like this country to country uh, uh, even if we distribute that across the globe and come up with some sort of consensus we're now saying okay even if we can get global consensus we're still time binding or, or or bound in our saying we have ethically arrived at the pinnacle of humanity. How, how do we well, safeguard we, against that? We clearly, we clearly haven't arrived at the pinnacle of humanity. And I think if if we weren't developing advanced technology so fast, I mean, then there's a potential for humanity to just evolve our consciousness more and more so that you know we're, we're better at manifesting unconditional love toward each other and openness and, and acceptance and we we can become more evolved and conscious humans without advanced technology it just takes us time right and the situation we're in now technology is developing really really fast it's developing faster than the sort of expansion and the maturation of of human consciousness right and i mean this this is what leads some people to want to pause or slow down ai development like a bunch of folks who signed the petition pushing to pause ai development recently but the bottom line is you know prohibitions on things that a lot of people want have never worked for too long across too much of the world in human history i mean briefcase nukes 
or biological warfare agents, fine, we can ban those because these have no particular use other than to kill a bunch of people, right? So AI can make people a lot of money, can improve everyone's business. Also, also, you know, it makes computer games more fun. It solves research problems better, has promised to cure cancer and Alzheimer's, right? Like there's, and if you're running a country, it's not just it can help you blow up your neighbors. It can help you become economically more powerful than than your neighbors, right? I mean, it's just too beneficial all across the map for it to be viable to sort of forcibly ban it or, or slow it down or something like that. On, 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 on the other hand, it's true then the technology is developing way faster than the maturity and the consciousness of the humans who are, are managing the rollout of the, of the technology, right? So I can see there's certainly a weakness to having the vast, you know, teeming democratic mass of humanity decide the future of, of AGI. But we're going back to Winston Churchill's quip that democracy is the worst possible system of government except <laughs> all the others ever tried, right? Because, I mean, what's the alternative? The alternative is the NSA. The alternative is the Chinese Communist Party, right? I'm, I'm, I'm in the, the – a small elite group is not really – a viable alternative. Even if you had a small elite group of noble-minded, ethical, evolved people with the only keys to the emerging AGI, I mean, everything would have to fall into place incredibly well for that small elite group not to get a gun put to their head by some uh, some military organization and uh, and have control taken from them, right? Um, so, I mean, the, the science fictional idea that you have like 10 evolved beneficial geniuses hiding in a basement bunker where no one can find them, bring about the singularity and unleashing it on the world. I mean, that's just, it's fantastically unlikely to to happen that way. <laughs> and it, it's far more likely that if AGI is developed in a centralized way, that means AGI being developed by, you know, groups with very narrow interests in mind, like making money for their shareholders or, or, or themselves or making their country, you know, bigger and tougher than all the other countries rather than having the good of humanity in mind. Yeah, absolutely. Well, so if there is an inevitable arms race, for example, for AGI or, or for even it's just already, better. It's already, it's already happening, right? Yeah, ex- I mean, it's exactly. Not, so then it's how- not a hypothesis. It's today's reality. So apart from uh, trying to regulate – AI, which uh, I don't think is going to happen, like you just mentioned, or even if it does happen, it's not going to work. How yeah. does how does the open source or how does the distributed AI win the arms race? So it's interesting to look at how open source is winning, right? And there was a recent memo released, leaked from Google that was written by a Google engineer, basically telling the Google management, like, Google has no moat. They have no defenses. You know, OpenAI has no moat and no defenses. It will be almost impossible for them to stop open source development of AI models that are smarter than what these big companies develop because the the algorithms underlying ChatGPT and BARD and all this are well known in the research community. I mean, the core algorithms are all from openly published papers. And... The reason the core algorithms are from openly published papers is that even if you're developing an algorithm secretly within OpenAI, Microsoft, or Google, if you put it out in an openly published paper, you know, 10,000 other people will jump on it and will vary it and will improve improve on it in in, in various ways. You can then use those improvements back in, in your company. You'll just go much faster if you open up your algorithm than if you keep it secret. And the... This is why companies like Google and OpenAI that publish their stuff have done so much better in AI than algorithms like Amazon and, and Apple that keep things more secret, right? So open source code, open source research has led to the advancement of AI because it brings so much collective brain power into the problem, right? But on, on, on the other hand, it also means that in the open source world, you know, as soon as something comes out from Google OpenAI or whatever, within six or twelve months, something better will pop up out of the open out of the open source world. Now, that's 
interesting. And then people aren't using it because it's open source. They're just using it because it works best, right? So, I mean, people use stable diffusion for image generation, not because they love the purity of the open source development process. They use it because it's available cheap and good, right? Mm. So I think to make decentralized deployments of advanced AI technology succeed, we need to do what's been done with open source. I mean, we need to make the, the decentralized systems actually better, right? We need to make them cheaper. We need to make them do more cool stuff. Then everyone will use them and everyone will use them because they're cheap and cool. And that not necessarily because they love the decentralized underlayer, but they don't mind the decentralized underlayer either. Just like they don't mind that stable diffusion is open source. So the best way to win is just to make a better product. Don't need to make a product that's going to yeah, make it better. Um, and the challenge of course, is that building on blockchain in some ways is harder than, than building on a centralized infrastructure like Google or, or, or Microsoft or, or Amazon has, right? I mean, blockchain technology is still, still rough around the edges. So you've got, you've got to make a better product using an infrastructure that's more difficult to build on. And if we can do that, then we can sort of pull off a miracle and we can make the singularity, you know, decentralized and democratic in its orchestration, which is going to have all sorts of positive effects. And I actually think we're on a good track to doing this, which is interesting. And I, I think if we can do it, it will be because, for example, my own AI team within SingularityNet and within the open source uh, OpenCog AGI project, it will be because we have better ideas about how to build AGI, right? So if, if I'm right that my team has better ideas about building AGI, then we can build something, launch it next year. It's a few times cleverer than ChatGPT, right? Mm -hmm. If we launch something cleverer than ChatGPT using our own AI tech, but we happen to do this on a decentralized infrastructure. I mean, then, then you have something quite interesting, right? And then, then the decentralized infrastructure helps because it makes it easier and easier to pull more and more developers into to building on this thing to get it to get it smarter and and smarter. I mean, OpenAI has a sort of app marketplace for ChatGPT, but tokenomics gives a lot of better ways to sort of power the growth of that sort of app marketplace, right? So I, I think, yeah, you want to make a better product. You want to roll this better product out using decentralized infrastructure for robustness and then integrate with tokenomic incentivization mechanisms to help grow a community and build more and more, more and more software around it. It also is all going to be open source code so that you, you have all the positive feedbacks that come from from uh, building open source communities. So is that the reason that you went with building on blockchain, uh, specifically for that incentivization and the... I mean, just the, the, original reason I, distribution? the original reason I wanted to build on blockchain was not about tokenomic incentivization. It was for robustness. The original reason was I thought, once we really get to AGI, some governments will try to shut this down. And, but how do you shut Bitcoin down, right? I mean, I thought about this in before Bitcoin in 2000, 2001. Like, once you really get a breakthrough to a thinking machine, all sorts of parties will try to take control of it. So you need it to be implemented in a way that's effectively impossible for anyone to take over. Right. And then then the whole politics of it will be will be different. Just just like no one tries to keep Iran off of Linux or off of the Internet. Right. Because the way these systems are designed is just they want to be free. They want to be mm -hmm. open and to spread. So you, you need to deploy AGI in a way that wants to be free and is very hard to take control of. And then 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 that will be the politics of it. The politics of it will be like the politics of, 
of Linux or, or the internet rather than like the politics of mobile or, or Microsoft Windows. So that that's actually how I started with it. If I was thinking about blockchain from a money point of view, I would have been Satoshi, right? Because I, mean, I, <laughs> I mean, it was 2000, 2001, I was putting strong encryption and distributed computing together. But I was trying to do it to build this decentralized AI networks, which is harder than, than decentralized money. And so I sort of punted on and decided to wait till computers were faster, right? Then, <laughs> then, it it mean, is Bitcoin, important to... Yeah, Bitcoin came along solving decentralized money, which is computationally an easier problem than decentralized AI. But now... Now we have the ability to solve decentralized AI too, because computers are way faster. Yeah, gotcha. I mean, it's not even just the money part though uh, in blockchain. You're helping to solve the incentivization or motivation, but incentive incentivization yeah, problem as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that 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 that's right. So that that's sort of a bonus. So I first got into it because of just robustness, but then, I mean, we funded a lot of the AI work we're doing now from sales of AGIX tokens on the SingularityNet platform. And since that time, we've designed a lot of subtler token models, like for the NuNet AI processor sharing network, for Rejuve, which is giving people incentive tokens for contributing bi biomedical data, right? We, we're launching a stable coin called Kajito, which is not pinned to fiat, but it's pinned to a to synthetic indices of, 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 of human, human progress. And then hypercycle wow. hypercycle. We just did a token sale for this is a ledgerless layer one blockchain. So we get rid of the ledger from blockchain to make it, make it much faster and, and more efficient. It's fundamentally peer to peer. So each, each of these different networks and singular net ecosystem has its own, tokens which is because you want a different incentivization model for for each of them right and i think this will be really really important in the next five years because we're going to see ai eliminating more and more human jobs right and and i think uh, you know in the end game, you have superhuman agi no one needs a job if the superhuman agi likes us it, its drones will just like physically airdrop 3D molecular <laughs> nano assemblers in everyone's backyard. You can 3D print whatever goods you want. You know, you're, you're, you're done, right? But en route to that potential rosy future, you have a potentially very difficult transition period where AI is taking a lot of people's jobs. And in the developed world, there will probably be universal basic income for everyone. I don't know who's going to give you universal basic income in the Congo or Central African Republic. You know, even a mid-level country like Brazil probably can't afford universal basic income for its population. So you'll have superpowers, sort of superpowers vying to uh, to take over these various countries in, in, in exchange for giving them money for basic income or something, right? So you're going to have an economic mess in the transition period to the singularity, even if the singularity comes out well, if you can have tokenomic incentivization in a way that's less perverse than the sort of tradfi economic system, you may be able to smooth out that transition period for, for a lot of, a lot of people. And I mean, I mean, this, uh, this is really important in terms of human well, being en route to the emergence of super AGI. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot to think about in that regard. <laughs> yeah, uh, <laughs> there certainly is. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, and the, as you said, the challenge is we can't even fucking think about abortion. You know, we, we can't we can't regulate porn appropriately. We 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 can barely we can barely handle like highway safety right without without randomly arresting black people for driving while black like we, we we we're so bad at managing many quite simple basic aspects of our of our collective life i mean we're, we're good at some things too modern society is is, is ama amazing right but 
but we fail at a lot of things that are much simpler than than regulating, say, a five year period of transition from here to AI smarter than people. It's clearly our government systems are not up to it, right? They can't adjust the regulations fast enough. They can't even deal with cryptocurrency. I mean, they're they're not going to be able to deal with with the emergence of 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 general intelligence. So we. We need not just ways of distributed computing. We need, you know, decentralized governance that actually works, right? And uh, again, the blockchain world, in theory, can deliver that. But I mean, the percentage of entities called DAO that are actually DAOs in any meaningful sense is quite <laughs> small, right? Yeah. I mean, it's uh, that's that's proved uh, it's proved a hard thing. I mean, democracy is hard. Blockchain provides powerful tools for it, but it doesn't make the problem easy. For you, are there any like hard road, bl- um, like off ramps or hard, uh, like time to pump the brakes. If we hit this point in development of AGI before humans or even politically, we can agree on these, you know, uh, th- that we value each other as human beings. Uh, are there any of those things or is it more of a case for you of, well, let's plow ahead and let's, let's just show what's possible and try to work out the kinks as we go along? I mean, the general methodology is to explore and develop and work out the kinks as you go along. I I think that's how every advanced technology and every new science is developed. I mean, mean, there sort of is no, there is no other way. And I mean, I think human governance has to work out the same way. Like we can't really figure out in advance how we're going to deal with AI obsoleting so many human jobs. I mean, whatever we figure out in advance isn't going to be how things really go down anyway. Like we, we, we need the interaction with reality as it unfolds to really think through these things pro- properly. I mean, I think it's important to have as many eyeballs as possible on the AGI as it develops. I mean, for similar reasons to why you know open source code tends to have fewer bugs than proprietary code. You've just got a huge number of, of uh, open source developers looking at code and running tests and, and, and so forth, right? So I mean I think I think uh, openness can help in 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 spotting issues. And certainly if you have a young AGI that wants to kill everyone, we'll all advocate turning it off and trying to fix it. Right? So, I, mean, sure. I mean, it's not, it's not full speed ahead, no, no matter what the circumstances, but I, I, I think uh, I would follow the notion of a proactionary rather than precautionary principle, meaning if you have a complex technology, which has obvious large benefits as well as some risks, I think the best course is just to try to develop it in as beneficial a way as possible, you're not going to stop it. If you pause development, someone else is going to is going to push ahead with development, and you have to ask, how likely is it they're going to be more ethical than you are in in, in their own development choices? Yeah, I mean that's a that's a big deal, uh, which we might have to talk about on a, on another podcast another time. Uh, what one last thing for today. Um, ben, if someone's listening or watching and keen to engage with the work that you're doing with Singularity Net, uh, what are some of the ways that they can do that? Say, if they if they are or aren't a coder, uh, what are some of those kinds of ways? Uh, yeah. So first of all, anyone who's interested in all these crazy things I've been talking about, you can go to singularitynet.io you can give your email sign up for our newsletter you can look at our various blog, blog posts if you're a coder you can look at very get github repos and papers on archive uh, my own website is gertzel.org which has links to singularity net and a bunch of a uh, bunch of other stuff that i'm engaged with uh, as 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 well you know we need open source developers certainly we can use people with a business development orientation to help figure out how to apply our technology to problems in in various vertical markets but 
the various projects in Singularity Net ecosystem really have a whole lot of different needs. Because I see there's Mindplex is an online magazine with some uh, AI-based and, and tokenomic aspects, which has a use for sort of anyone who can who can write and 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 comment to help grow the grow the knowledge base there. So I think if if you join our mailing list, join our, our Telegram group and, and, and Discord, you get a sense of which projects are most active in our in our ecosystem. And there's lots of ways to jump in as a as a volunteer as as well as some uh, open open job positions. Sounds great. Ben, thank you so much for joining us today. Really, really appreciate it. And uh, all the best with your current and future endeavors. All right. Yeah, thanks a lot. It's been a pleasure. Thanks for joining us today. Great to chat with Dr. Ben Goertz. A wide-ranging conversation today. Hope to have him back on the show sometime soon. We love bringing you great guests and hope we inspired you to learn more about Web3, about technology, about AI, and about the future. And as always, please like and subscribe. It really helps the show. Uh, even better yet, share and a uh, part of the episode that you found really helpful with a friend. And join us again next week for another exciting episode of the Off Chain Podcast. Catch you then. Mm-hmm.